Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time here, my name is Molly, and today I'm going to be having a little bit of a discussion on the previous episode of Game of Thrones, which was Season 8, Episode 3. If you watched my reaction video, you are aware that at the end of the episode I really wasn't in a frame of mind to get into a deep discussion about some of the things that we saw. I was a little emotional, especially after seeing what happened with Theon and Jorah, um, and I was still processing some of the big kind of events and twists that we saw that had occurred that were somewhat unexpected. Um, but I've, I've had some time to process now, I've taken a few days, and I've also rewatched the episode a couple of times. I've gone online and engaged in a lot of discussion with people on, on sites, especially on Reddit, but in other areas too. And I know that there's some pretty intense and differing opinions on this episode right now. So, I'm going to say before I get into this that all of this is just my perspective, my opinion. Um, I am someone, I've mentioned previously, who has been watching the show since the beginning, and I had read the four available books prior to the first season, and then of course I've since then also read the fifth book, and I've read those books, reread them multiple times. So I've been very much involved in this world, a huge fan of it for a long, long time, so I do understand that there are very strong opinions on this, um, and that they, they tend to differ. And I would just like to ask before we get into anything that people in the comments, you know, if you disagree, that's totally fine and understandable and good, but maybe just be respectful of each other. Because I know that sometimes people can get a little heated when discussing things that they're very passionate about. Um, so, alright. Jumping into it, I know that a lot of people have been very upset about things that they saw in this episode, extremely, extremely critical. I've seen people say things like that this has ruined the show for them, has ruined the whole series for them, um, that, they, that they feel like this particular episode really just threw everything out the window in terms of what they had expected regarding the Night King and Jon in particular. And I can kind of understand why people have these feelings. I can, I can understand some disappointment, I can understand some, some, some frustration, um, things that were expected didn't happen, things that happened were unexpected, um, but I kind of have a different outlook on some of these things, and, and I'm going to be giving a little bit of a defense of some of them here. So let me just start off by saying there's a number of different criticisms of this episode, and I'm not really going to be getting much in depth into one, the actual ability to see things. Um, I was able to make out everything that was happening when I watched the episode, but it was extremely dark, and I understand that some people were not or found it very confusing. I thought it was very similarly done to Hard Home, except that it was darker. Um, but I do understand that some people have criticisms that it was very confusing because they couldn't see and they felt it would be better if it was lighted along the lines of Helm's Deep, and I can understand that, but that's really not what I'm looking into. I'm also not going to spend a lot of time talking about things like the foolishness of the battle plans. Um, I know a lot of people are saying, why would the Dothraki just be sent out to charge, and why were there so many soldiers outside the walls? And I can understand that, but for me, even when that was happening, I wasn't particularly surprised. I thought that they had already built up the fact that, you know, during discussions of the battle plans, people had suggested to Jon the dragon should be on the front lines, the dragon should be guarding Winterfell and everyone else, and he had pretty explicitly said, no, our goal needs to be to draw out the Night King and protect Bran, and so... Basically, to me, I understood the Dothraki and all the soldiers out there to pretty much be partially there to draw out the Night King, to bring in the army of the dead, to lure them in, to make them think that there was no danger, and that to bring the Night King out, because as Jamie said, he's not going to just show himself if he knows that he can be killed and end up all of this. And so, in my opinion, they were always going to kind of be sacrificial lambs, almost, as part of this process, and I'm sure that they expected that they would last longer, or they hoped they would. Um, 
but I don't know. I, I can understand why people are upset about that. It obviously seems like a horribly strategic plan. Um, but then again, John's not great with strategy <laughs> in many instances. And so just, just to say that was not a big issue for me. And so those are two criticisms I've heard, but I'm not really focusing on them with this video. The three main concerns, criticisms that I have heard that I want to talk about are one, the fact that the Night King and the Army of the Dead was stopped here at Winterfell after this battle with three episodes left to go, and that leaves Cersei as kind of the big bad ending villain. Um, and a lot of people are very disappointed because they feel like this, this built up the Night King and the Army of the Dead for not much at all. Um, Two, the fact that Arya is the one that ended up dispatching, finally killing the Night King. Um, a lot of people were disappointed about that for various reasons, um, some having to do with just their expectations concerning Jon, others having to do with prophecy. I'll get to that in a second. And then three, the concern that a lot of people had that not enough people died, or the idea that there was too much plot armor going on in the episode. So, those are the three things I want to look at. So let's start with the Night King and the Army of the Dead being stopped in episode three. I personally was surprised by this. I didn't expect that the Army of the Dead would be defeated at Winterfell, the Night King would be killed there. I actually was thinking that there was a chance that the Night King wouldn't even show up there because he, as Jamie said, knows that he's the kind of key to ending everything. Um, and I, like everyone else, was expecting that they were going to lose that battle, that just a few survivors would remain who would have to flee and then go to King's Landing and try to make some sort of pact with Cersei and then deal with whatever was left of the Army of the Dead. I was fully expecting that myself. So I was surprised that that didn't happen. Um, but, looking back on it, now that we know that the Night King's entire goal was to get Bran, to kill Bran, that that was his main purpose, of course he was going to come to Winterfell where Bran was. So, of course he was going to be there, um, as one thing. And so, what should have happened? Should we have had a situation where they killed almost everyone and a few survivors got away and then we have another big White Walker Night King battle at the end? Maybe. That could have been interesting to see. But the more and more that I think about it, the more that this actually makes a lot of sense to me and that I highly anticipate that we're actually going to end up with something very similar in the books, if they ever come out, where the threat of the others, um, of the Long Night is ended, and then our kind of main characters who survive that still have to kind of pick up the pieces and deal with human conflict in the aftermath. Um, and to me, this actually makes a lot of sense thinking back at a lot of the things that George R. R. Martin has said over the years, both about his, his various plans, um, and particularly if I think about it in light of the various things he's said about his views on and his love of Lord of the Rings and Tolkien. So, George R. R. Martin, contrary to what a lot of people think, is actually a huge fan of Lord of the Rings. He has said there's some things that disappointed him. But, one of the things that he has constantly talked about and has said that is his, his kind of inspiration for the end of Game of Thrones is the way that Lord of the Rings ended in a kind of bittersweet nature, partially because Frodo and some of the other characters were so deeply scarred and impacted by their experiences that even though they won, there was no home to go back to. They couldn't go home again, they couldn't just experience the joy and relief of having defeated this big evil um, supernatural force. They could never go back to the way things were before. But also more than this, he has also specifically said that one of his favorite parts of the entire saga is what happens after the hobbits go home once Sauron and the threat from Mordor is ended, and that is the sc scouring of the Shire. Um, for those of you that haven't read the books, because this isn't in the movie, when the hobbits leave, return home, they find that a lot of the orcs and, and Sauron's minions who have lived, survived in the aftermath of the defeat, have fled that way and have actually kind of taken over 
inhabited and enslaved. The hobbits burn down their homes. And so what ends up happening is they have to fight another battle against lesser evils, lesser opponents, and against things like corruption. And people start turning on each other. So there is no actual simple happy ending where our heroes should be able to just relax and say, look, we've defeated this monstrous force. Instead, they have to go and fight another war, a more mundane one. And the idea that despite the how this should have brought everyone together, in the end, that's not what happens. And so to me, thinking about that, it actually makes a ton of sense that George R. R. Martin would put a plan in place where they're going to all come together for the purpose of defeating the others, but then nonetheless, they can't just have their happy, relaxing moment of triumph in the aftermath. Instead, they have to deal with a continuation of the human conflict that they had realized was so simple and stupid before, and we see them reverting to that. They can't just have their happy ending. And so, actually, I think that makes a ton of sense and is more interesting than if we just saw the Night King being defeated in King's Landing at the end and then some coronation of whoever, you know, defeats him and survives. This way it also brings us back to a lot of what Game of Thrones was earlier on, and I know, again, a lot of people feel like this takes away from the Night King, but they really did show the various things that the Night King was capable of doing, um, and he has been an extremely destructive force. You know, Daenerys has lost almost her entire army and a dragon. So this also puts us in a very interesting position for her, where she's going to have to basically rely on trying to get the support of the Northerners and whoever's left from the Vale if she wants to go forward and try to defeat Cersei, even assuming that Jon doesn't try to press some sort of claim, which I assume he won't. And what happens if they don't want to support her in fighting Cersei? Is she going to take her dragons and go south and attack King's Landing and potentially risk innocent people? And what's going to happen now with Jaime and Tyrion? Now that, you know, th this actual evil force has been defeated, is Jaime still going to want to go against Cersei? What if he doesn't? Where's Tyrion's role in this? So I think it puts a lot of interesting human conflict back in play. Things that people have been saying they've been missing in the past couple of seasons as we've been turning more towards this evil source. Alright, so second, we'll talk a little bit about Arya. Now, people have made some complaints about things like, well, how did she sneak up on the Night King? How did she get past all of them? And I don't really think that those complaints need need to really be there, to be honest, because it's been well established that she's stealthy, that she's fast, and yes, she was having to hide from whites when she was in the library, so people were saying, well, she was scared and having to hide from them, but then she runs past all these other ones. Well, we already saw that the Night King had everybody holding back, restraining them from doing any fighting at that point, even when Theon was still alive, he wanted to be the one to do this. So all the whites are just standing still there, and she runs quickly past the White Walkers. And I also don't think that she jumped from anything. It seemed to me very obvious that she ran and jumped through the air. Um, but anyway, those are like the smaller points. The bigger points that a lot of people have been making to me, to me and to others online is that they don't feel like Arya was the one who should have killed the Night King, that there was so much built up with Jon both in terms of various stare-downs he's had with the Night King and how he's been the one fighting against this all along, and having to do with the prophecies, the prince that was promised, Azor Ahai. So first, the John situation. I think people need to take into account that just because John isn't the one that actually stabbed and defeated the Night King in that way doesn't mean that he's not the one who is ultimately responsible for the Night King's defeat. He is. John is the one who convinced everyone that this this actually was a threat that existed. He's the one that brought Daenerys and the dragons and the Dothraki north. He's the reason that Arya came back home in the first place. He's the reason that Winterfell was taken back over by Starks. He brought all of these groups of people together. So had none of that happened, you know, the Night King still wouldn't have been defeated, okay? The White Walkers still wouldn't have been defeated. So Jon did play a crucial role, and to act as though he didn't because he's just not the one that stabbed the Night King in the end doesn't make a ton of sense to me. But going beyond that, getting into the prophecy situation. Many, many people believe 
that John is the prophecy prince that was promised, perhaps Azor Ahai reborn. Other people have argued that Daenerys makes more sense as Azor Ahai, considering that she woke dragons out of stone, born them in salt and smoke. And then there's the issue of Lightbringer. So when we look at these prophecies, I think it's important to keep in mind that both the show and the books have told us that prophecy is a dangerous thing and should never be taken just literally and at face value. So first of all, there's a possibility that prophecy could have had nothing to do, this and, and do with this and been pointless, but I don't think that we should really assume that given that we have seen, you know, the Lord of Light resurrected John. Some magical force did allow Danny to birth her dragons, walk into stone. But I think it makes more sense to think of the prophecy as something that can't be read literally. And a theory that a lot of book readers have had for many, many years is that there won't just be one person who represents all of these things, who won't be the prince that is promised and Azor Ahai, and, and that it won't be straightforward and simple of one hero coming forward and tempering a magic sword that he'll then use to end this. Um, and I'll also add that the prophecy actually says the prince that was promised will bring the dawn. It never explicitly says the prince that was promised will kill the Night King or, or use his sword to kill a White Walker or other. So I think if you really want to look at the prophecy, it's still possible to look at what happened and say that maybe John, in some ways is representative of the prince that was promised. As I just mentioned, he is ultimately responsible for the end of the White Walkers, so you can still argue that he ended the Long Night, he brought the dawn by his actions. He can still be seen as that, he was resurrected, you know, he can be viewed as the prince that was promised, coming from this particular bloodline, and how Rhaegar was constantly interested in that and thinking it would be one of his children. You can still look at it that way. You can look at Daenerys as some sort of representation of Azor Ahai, Waking dragons out of stone, born amid salted smoke. And maybe you can look at Arya in a way as a representation of Lightbringer. I know that one seems a little far-fetched to a lot of people, and I don't think this is necessarily how they necessarily want it to be, but I've seen this theory and I think actually, in some ways, it does kind of fit. You go back to Arya's entire storyline, all right? She is called a sword by Serio. You are a sword, that's what you are. She is trained by this water dancer. She is trained by various different figures, all with the idea that she is working for the God of Death or fighting against the God of Death. Um, that's Arya's entire story and plotline. But more than that, you can look at it as John is the person that gave Arya her first sword, who encouraged her in the first place to actually become a fighter, who put all of this in motion so that she would be there. So it kind of does make sense to think of Arya as a weapon, a sword, that was forged by John and then was used to end this long night. Um, People might think that that's a bit of a stretch, but I think that it actually makes more sense to look at the prophecies from the stories in that sort of way that's not literal than it is to look at them as there's this one figure who was going to temper his sword in the heart of the woman that he loved and have it burst into flame and then he was going to end the long night with it. So I actually don't have a problem with Arya's role there. Whether she fits that prophecy or not, I think that it's a nice interpretation. I also, again, think that it fits very well with her kind of interactions with and, and surrounding the concept of death throughout her entire storyline. So I think that that was built up in, in a good way. And then finally, let's just briefly talk about the idea that not enough people died or that there was too much plot armor. I think you can kind of divide these out a little bit. I think the plot armor thing is more of a valid criticism than the idea that not enough people died. Personally, for me, I think that people need to keep in mind that while in a realistic situation, more people probably would have died in a battle like that, this is a television show. It's a long-running dramatic series with a lot of characters we're heavily invested in. And what would actually have happened if, say, in addition to the deaths we had, we also had Sam die and Brienne die or Tormund die? One thing is that there would be emotional fatigue for the audience. 
That episode was already emotionally fatiguing and draining enough as it was. And, and I'm sure those of you who watched it can, can also attest, you feel the adrenaline pumping afterwards. It was an intense experience. So what happens if you suddenly have that many significant characters dying in that episode? Well, for one thing, you have to make their deaths fairly quick. We got some good death scenes for Theon and Jorah, and Theon and Jorah were two season one major significant characters who deserved the amount of attention that they were given in this episode. If you also had to kill off Sam and Brienne, even, even say not Tormund, just those two, you would need to at least half the time devoted to both Theon and Jorah's last stands and deaths, and you would only be able to give that small amount of time to the deaths of Sam and Brienne too, two also extremely significant characters from nearly the beginning of the show. That doesn't give enough emotional weight to any of their deaths, to any of their last moments. It's not fair to either the characters or to the actors that have played them or to the audience that has become attached to them to have them go out in that quick of a moment without any sort of actual emphasis on them. That's my perspective on it anyway. Um, and again, also it would make the whole situation seem less overall emotional. You would be numb. You wouldn't be able to really fully process it. And that doesn't even take into account the fact that since this is episode 3, there's still roles that those characters almost certainly have to play before the show ends. So I think saying that not enough big characters died, that the show wasn't brave in going with that way, isn't really the right way to look at it. Um, because there would be some serious flaws and negatives to having more big characters die in this episode. So, as I was saying, I think that the plot armor thing is a bit more of a valid criticism because the writers didn't necessarily have to have Sam, say, almost die multiple times and us witness that um, and put all the characters in situations where it seems like they're on the verge of death and then they make it. So I do think that that is a much more valid criticism of the way that things were set up. On the other hand, I also do think that it's kind of a double-edged sword, you know, because what are they going to do? They're either going to do something like that where there's tension in the moments constantly and where all of our main characters are readily visible on screen, or what? They're going to shuffle even more of those characters down into the crypt to not do much of anything at all? And then have not much tension in the episode just because a lot of people we don't care about are out there fighting and dying. So I think that it's, again, it's one of those complex situations where on the surface it seems straightforward, but it really isn't. Because if you think about the other possibilities, they aren't necessarily better. Alright guys, so I know that a lot of people are going to heartily and strongly disagree with me on all of these points, or at least some of them. And that's totally fine, and I welcome, I welcome that, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Um, and if you have any questions or comments for me, please do leave them down below. But again, let's, let's all stay civil and respectful because we all love this material and whether we have different opinions on it or not, that doesn't change. And I'm very much looking forward to episode four and seeing with how all of our characters deal with the aftermath of this. <laughs> all right, so I'll just wrap this up now and say thank you very much for joining me today and hopefully I'll see you next time.